Well, I hope you're doing well. I want to continue our series about reaching um, difficult audiences. If you join me in Matthew 19 is where we'll start. Matthew 19. This is a little mini-series in our Sunday school. We first looked at reaching those who are, you know, in, in a cult, or maybe they grew up in a cult. A cult being someone who, is, uh, who gets cr salvation wrong says that salvation is by works or some other way than salvation by grace through faith. Last week I met a man who did not want to believe in Christ, did not even want to hear about Christ. And I was like, why? Why don't you want to talk about this? And he said, I was raised. One of my parents was Catholic. The other one was Lutheran. I've heard this my whole life. I'm like, no, you haven't heard the truth. You've been raised in two cults that teach work salvation. So you haven't heard what Christ really did. But that's a hard audience, raised in this um, heretical and, and raised in heresy. Then we looked at trying to reach friends and family. We did that last week. And that's an audience where we have no honor, right? They're, they're, not going, they're, they're unlikely to listen to us because they know us so well just as they did not want to listen to Christ in his own country. Today I want to look at the difficult audience that is wealthy people, well, rich people. And we may think that this is a topic for somebody else who knows rich people, but I want to tell you that I think it's actually a very relevant topic to every one of us. Because you think about America, this uh, affluent nation, one of the wealthiest nations in the history of the world, still is one of the wealthiest nations with people enjoying one of the highest standards of living. In that sense, we have a lot of rich people in this nation. We're not missing meals. We have roofs over our heads, right? We've got cars. We have cell phones, internet connections, right? I mean, we're not like impoverished as some people might be in Africa or the Middle East or wherever. We have many um, signs that we are wealthy. So with this in mind, how do we reach and what's the difficulty with wealthy people? Why is it difficult? Well, let's start here with what Christ says in Matthew 19, verse 16. Remind ourselves of this truth straight from the mouth of Jesus Christ. Look at Matthew 19, verse 16. And behold, one came and said unto him, Master, or good master, what good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? This rich man's interested in having eternal life. Sounds like a good thing. But watch 17. He said to him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. Christ is hitting him. This man believes that it's, you earn your own righteousness and mankind becomes good enough to inherit eternal life. Christ, who is God, though speaks from his humanity, saying that there is none good, Right? Among men, we're all, they are all sinners. Look at 18. He saith unto him, which, which commandments? Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Jesus lists a whole bunch of commandments. This man, watch, 20 says, The young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? This rich young ruler really has a high opinion of himself. He's tried to keep a lot of laws. He, I bet he has kept a lot of laws, although I doubt he's even kept all these all the way. Honor thy father and mother. Thou shalt not bear false witness. A lot of these I'll guarantee he's been guilty of at least once. And you know we read in James, if you offend in one point, you're guilty of all. But watch Jesus here. Give us a lesson of how to reach this man who has not owned up on what his true defining sin is, which is covetousness. But watch Jesus hit him right in the, in the face with this. 21, Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. Jesus, like he does with so many people, he hits them smack in the face with his biggest sin, right? Remember, he hit the woman at the well, boom, there's your biggest sin of adultery. With this guy, boom, you're a covetous man and you know it. Tell you what, if you were perfect, if you were sinless, you just sell everything you got. You give it away. Hits him right in the face with his sin. I think we'll teach a lesson about how to reach the wealthy audience, but I think we've got to get real about that sin of covetousness. 
Because this guy thinks it's no big deal that he's been coveting things his whole life, gathering things his whole life, will never let go of those things his whole life, yet I'm still perfect. No, it's called a sin. It's called covetousness. 22, but when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. That's where his heart's at. His heart is with his earthly treasures. He owns many earthly treasures, and his earthly treasures own him. Watch what Christ says now in 23. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Christ says this is very hard for rich people to believe in Jesus Christ and be saved. It's not that we work our way to heaven, but this sin of covetousness is very binding. And for this rich young man, he has all these worries now. Well, if I believe in Christ, everything I love will be in jeopardy, right? If I, go li if I live for the Lord all my whole life and everything I've gained will be in jeopardy. This same thought is what goes through rich people's minds today. If I really get saved and I really get busy for the Lord, well, what's going to happen to my business? What's going to happen to my financial standing, my community standing? They've got, they feel like they have so much to lose. Look at 25, when his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, with God all things are possible. Of course, Christ tells us, assures us, that everyone can be saved, because with God all things are possible. But boy, he did make a point to say, The wealthy are a difficult audience to reach, and our world is full of them. Our families are full of them. Our neighborhoods are full of wealthy people. Why are they so difficult to reach? I think as I've been saying so far, point one, rich men are difficult to reach because they tend to be ruled by the sin of covetousness. It's a, it's a blinding thing, a very um, uh, overpowering sin, the sin of covetousness. Let me read you. i got a lot of verses, so I'll have to read some today for the sake of time. 1 Corinthians 6.10 says, Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Ephesians gives us that same list, remember? It says, Nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. In those lists, they list covetousness as a, a, a sin that defines a person, and it becomes their title. So much so that that's what owns them, that's what drove them, and th such people, it's, it's clear that they have not accepted Christ, their Savior, they're not heaven-bound, because that's all what they're about, is their covetousness. Ecclesiastes, I read this verse the other day. Listen to this one. Ecclesiastes says, He that loveth silver, Ecclesiastes 5.10, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. You know the problem with the covetous mind? It's never satisfied. It never has enough. Think about rich people. Are they done getting richer? No. No. You make your first 100000 then you want to make 200000 You become a millionaire, you become, want to become a multimillionaire. Multimillionaires want to become billionaires. It's never enough, right? Never safe enough. What if you get sued? What if economic downturn? You need extra millions. I know some of you all in the audience have extra millions, so I'm not trying to step on toes, but it's still true. Wealth is a never-ending pursuit. Building wealth is a never ending, there's never a stopping point where you've reached it. That's it. Building wealth also comes with, sadly, often building pride and building a false sense of security in your money and also a false sense of achievement. Rich people buy into this fallacy that somehow that bag of money proves some sort of moral worth or some sort of achievement, right, that's to be applauded. It's a fallacy that a bag of money equals true success. It's a fallacy. Okay. But point one, why rich people are difficult to reach, they tend to be ruled by the sin of covetousness. Please look at Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6. I'll show you my next point. 
I like to define why there's why these audiences are difficult to reach because I think that'll help us reach them with the gospel, reach them with truth. There are rich people who don't aren't coming to the Savior. There are also rich people who aren't serving the Savior because they're too busy serving Mammon, ungodly Mammon. And the money is dictating where they live, what they do on Sundays, how they serve, how bold they are. Don't, I don't know a lot of really wealthy people who are bold in the scriptures. I don't know. All right? I know a lot of wealthy people who claim to be Christians, but you'd never know it unless you had them in a tiny little private conversation. They might then admit it to you. My second point, why it's difficult to reach the wealthy is that they tend to be filled with pride and to have forgotten God. Look at Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. People today often replace the Lord there with money, right? You love money with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might. I'm laughing, but it's really true. It's very, very true. Six, in these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. God and God's truths are to be what we talk about, think about, teach all day long. But again, to my point, you could replace this teaching of God's truth with thinking about money. And we think about it when we're sitting down, when we're rising up in the morning and the evening. Eight, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. While the rich person should be busy teaching his children the things of God, Often the only, the only wisdom we're handing down from generation to generation are the keys to the business, or here's how I got rich, or here's an occupation that you can get rich in. We should be teaching them God's truths from the Word of God. Look at 9. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house. For Deuteronomy 6.10. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abram, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of all good things which thou fillest not, and wells digged which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not, when thou shalt have eaten and be full, then Beware, lest thou forget the Lord, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. We get full houses, we forget God. That's what the, that's what, what the warning was here for the children of Israel. I think this warning is very applicable, and this downfall is very applicable to America today. Uh, once a God-fearing nation, blessed in so many ways, but now our houses are full and people have forgotten the God that gave us this land, right? That gave us the prosperity we enjoy, that got us through world wars, that keeps us standing today, and with the liberty we enjoy today. We've forgotten God. This verse, to me, is very much like America, and how affluent we are, how lost we are, because we've forgotten who's given us all these good things. Americans, we tend to rise early. Work hard for money. We have full houses, but we've forgotten God and we surely are not teaching our children the way of the Lord. Proverbs 30, 8 and 9 says this. It says, Give me poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take thy name, the name of God, in vain. That verse tells us that, that truth again. We can get so full and have no needs that we forget who is the Lord. Money, it can be this false sense of security, it can be this great distraction that has us forget about God, reality. Sad then, isn't it, that many of us still, in our heart of hearts, we still want to be rich, despite all these dangers that the world explains to us. We want our children to be wealthy. Oh, my kids to be really successful in finances. Make them successful in faith. Set them up to be successful in faith. If you fail in the finances, so be it. They'll be okay. But if they fail in the faith, it's the end of the world. They're not going to get saved. They're not going to live for the Lord. They don't have faith. 
Please turn in your Bibles with me to Psalm. Um, <clears throat> look at Psalm 62 real quickly. Psalm 62. <clears throat> We're talking today about another difficult audience to reach, and it is the wealthy. Christ says it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle, right, than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God to get saved. Psalm 62, verse 10, real quick, I have a lot of verses. I'm going to speed through these, but look at this verse, Psalm 62, verse 10. It says, Trust not in oppression, and become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. That's easier said than done. Riches increase. Who's ever had like a bonus or, you know, you get your tax return, you get some extra wealth. Who just, I don't know, I don't even think about it. It doesn't matter to me. No, it's hard, isn't it? Well, think about, let's say if you had like a really life-changing career move. Now you're making hundreds of thousands. It would be difficult not to dwell on that hundreds of thousands. It's a, just the a truth. It steals our heart. Our heart becomes where that treasure is. Because all the things it can get us and all the status it brings us. Well, the Bible warns us, set not your heart upon these riches. It can happen. It can be a great distraction. You lose sight of what's really important as your bank account increases. So what's the devil's role? Is the devil striving to make everybody impoverished? Maybe that's his target for some, but I'll bet you for a lot of people, he wants to make them successful and have them thinking about their dollars, whether it's, it's a thousand bucks or a hundred thousand bucks. He wants you thinking about that. Look back, please, at Psalm 49. The love of money is the root of all evil, it tells us in 1 Timothy. So let me go through this list now. We've said it's difficult for wealthy people to get saved or do what's right because they're ruled by the sin of covetousness. They're filled with pride that makes them forget God. Um, and here they tend, I'll talk about, my next point is that they tend to trust in their riches. It's their, it's their fortress. It's their high tower. Look at Psalm 49 and verse 6. This whole chapter speaks to this. So let's, let's read a little bit. 49, let's, verse 6. <clears throat> they that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him, for the redemption of their soul is precious and ceaseth forever. People get a big pile of money. They trust in it for everything. It's what's going to get them by. It's what's going to get them through but this is a lie about wealth. We know there are many things that money cannot buy. Money, we talk about almost cliche, so much that we forget that it's true. But money cannot buy happiness, right? But to this point, money cannot buy redemption. Bill Gates cannot buy his way out of the fact that he's a sinner. It takes a much more precious payment, the blood of Christ, to make that payment. His money falls far, far short. Not redeemed with silver of gold, right, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Look at verse... It says, look at verse 8, For the redemption of their soul is precious, and it ceaseth forever. And he shall... That he should still live forever and not see corruption. For he seeth that wise men die, likewise the fool and the brutish person perish, and leave their wealth to others. So rich men die, and then it goes to somebody else. Look at 11. Their inward thought, though, is that their houses shall continue forever, and their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. We have this fallacy with riches that they were so wonderful for us and bought us all kinds of happiness and we'll leave them for the next generation. That's a high calling and they'll buy the next generation happiness. No, it delivers a big lie to the next generation. They buy off in this lie. America is filled now with generation after generation of passing down wealth instead of passing down faith. We've missed the mark. 12. Nevertheless, man being in honor abideth not, and he is like the beast that perish. Rich people were no different than animals. This is this their way, is their folly, yet their posterity approve their sayings, Selah. They think their, their posterity validates the way we live. Well, we're wealthy people, so we must be living right. We're rich, right? So we must be righteous. No such thing. 
14, like sheep they are laid in the grave, death shall feed upon them. No rich man has ever found the way around this yet. You know, the Egyptians tried to get a way around it, didn't they? They would mummify themselves, all right? Embalm themselves, give themselves these fancy chambers in the ground. It did not matter. They still decay, they're still dead. No escaping this, no matter if you're the wealthiest person in the world, and those pharaohs were probably the wealthiest people in the world. It says, um, and the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning, and their beauty shall consume in the grave from their dwelling. Trying to maintain that beauty, the Egyptians took it all the way to the afterlife, trying to maintain their beauty of their de decaying flesh. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. You see wealthy people today, especially some of the famous celebrities, they do everything they can to preserve their beauty. It's just, it's just a fight against inevitability, though. They're going to decay and grow old. Find something else that is glorious, and it's not our flesh. 16, be not thou afraid when, the, when one is made rich, when the glory of his house is increased. Sometimes we, even if it's believers, we're intimidated by that. Or they're like, wow, that person's really doing well, so maybe they're really right with God and we're not. We suppose that gain is godliness. It's not. It's not. We don't need to be envious of the wealthy. There's nothing of real value there. 17, for one dieth, he shall carry nothing away. The Bible says we've brought nothing into this world. It's certain we can carry nothing out. It says his glory shall not descend after him. Though while he lived, he blessed his soul. Men will praise thee when thou doest well to thyself. He shall go to the generation of his fathers. They shall never see light. Man that is in honor and understand not is like the beast that perish. This is what I mean. Wealth is this great big fallacy. We think this pile of money, this collection of possessions, it brought us some esteem on earth, so it's going to bring us ongoing glory. No, it's not. It's a great fallacy. It's a great fool's errand to live our life for money. And for our point today is it blinds the eyes. We see such glory in our possessions that we, we miss the mark of what is truly important, and that is the redemption of souls. And that's only done by the blood of Jesus Christ. Please look. I want to read a few more. We are going to get back to the New Testament for some good examples here. But look over at Psalm 52, please. Psalm 52, verse 7. <laughs> Lo, says, 527, Lo, this is the man that made not God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches, and strengthened himself in his wickedness. Wealth gives people a false sense of accomplishment, a false sense of having God's favor. It does not correlate. Your bank account does not mean you're right with God, right? Whether high or low. 1 Timothy 6.5 tells us this truth. It says, Men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. You ever talk to a wealthy man? I've talked to a few in my life. And the conversations they do hedge around, oh yeah, boy, God's really blessing me this season. It's just been a great year. A great, you know, great financial numbers. And now we're doing this with our business. And they try to connect their business to something they can say is good, right? Because then their wealth is really righteousness because they're connecting to some little piece of helping someone somewhere. But gain is not godliness. No such thing. That's what First um, Timothy 6, 5 tells us. Proverbs eleven twenty eight says, He that trusteth in his riches shall fall, but the righteous shall flourish as a branch. Trusting in riches. Big mistake instead of trusting in God. Let's look at Proverbs. I'll show you a few Proverbs that talk about this. Wealthy, wealthy, wealthy. We call it a blessing. When it comes to accepting Christ, it can be quite a significant curse. Because people forget about God and remember money. People trust in, um, instead of trusting God, they trust in their money. Look at Proverbs 15, verse 17. Proverbs 15, 17. The sad thing is, there's many Christians today who want to become wealthy. Well, I want to leave an inheritance for my kids. Well, make sure you don't 
uh, fail to pass down faith as the, as the inheritance. Proverbs 15, um, 17. Let's go 16. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. The Bible's true. We can't argue with it. Better is a dinner of herbs where love is than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. You can destroy your home. You can destroy your kids. You can destroy your marriage trying to become one of the wealthy or to maintain the wealth that you've already accumulated. Look at verse uh, 27. 27. He that is greedy of gain troubleth his own house, but he that hateth gifts shall live shall live it's very true even the, the the data supports this that money is the biggest source of conflict right in marriages and homes biggest cause of divorce arguments about money and this is true even in christian homes so we've got to get rid of this this idea of having to have more greedy of gain you trouble your own house <coughs> look at verse proverbs 18 please Proverbs 18, verse 10. In America, this problem is widespread. This is America. Trusting in our wealth. Thinking wealth is glorious. Respecting people more because they have a, a nicer car or a bigger house or a greater bank account. It's stupidity. Proverbs 18 and verse 10. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth unto it and is safe. You want to raise stable kids, stable families, tell them who the strong tower is. It's Jesus Christ. And then your kid, when they get depressed, when they get older, they're going to run to God and be strengthened. Not going to kill themselves. They're not going to go into this uh, problem or this bad path. They're going to run to God. Look at 11. The rich man's wealth is his strong city and has the high wall and his own conceit. Rich men run to their wealth and sadly, many times it's found wanting. Remember the stories in the Great Depression. I remember these the, the stories in the history books of the rich men jumping out of windows and stuff, right? Killing themselves because that was their high tower and they lost it all. But we do this with our kids as well. They see mom and dad trusting in money to get them through. So the kids trust in their money, but money lets you down. And then depression really gets bad. Look please at... Um, well, let me read it for you. Sake of time again. 1 Timothy 6.10. 1 Timothy 6 has some good wisdom here, but 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Key passage, we read it a lot, but that love of money is at the root, right? It's the cause of the bad things you see in the world. Whether in a big sense, a national sense, or an individual sense, it's a root there of all evil. People covet after it, and they err from the way of faith, pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Let's go to Matthew chapter 16. We'll finish here in the Gospels with our story of a rich man that was, that was reached. But first, let's look at the downfall of a couple more rich men. Think about what's going through their heads. How are they so fooled by money? Matthew 16. <clears throat> it's not what's going to get you through in life. Even Christians, we think, well, we've we got to get this good paying career. We have to have this good paying job. It's what's going to be so important for that young family is to have this good career. No, what's so important for that young family is to get in church, get in their Bibles, grow in faith. That's what's important. And if we don't have this down, we're not going to be able to make that argument very well. People right now are making decisions. Well, you know, should I go work outside the home or should I raise my kids? Well, raise your kids because you raise them stronger in faith. Invest faith into those little kids of yours instead of dollars. But I got to have enough money to buy my kids this and buy my kids that. They'll be okay with some sticks and some rocks, but a Bible. Get them a Bible. Look at Matthew. 16, verse 25. <clears throat> 16, 25. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever loses his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Sounds like the passage we read there in the Old Testament. But my next point here is rich men. The other thing that holds them back is that rich men 
they tend to feel that they have too much to lose, right, by becoming a Christian, living out the Bible. Too much to lose and too little to gain. The truth is that what rich men have gained is worth this much, nothing. That's what, that's what they gain. And what they're bound to lose is everything. Their souls, eternal salvation. So I know it, it held that rich young ruler back. Well, if I become a Christian, then I'm going to lose this whole nice lifestyle I've got. And realize, what will it profit you if you gain the whole world? Every dollar across this whole world, every gold bar across the whole world, what good would it be if you gain it all, but you lose your own soul? Christ tells us this wisdom. Look at Luke. Let's go to the book of Luke. We'll close in the book of Luke. Three passages quickly in Luke. Luke 12. <clears throat> The Bible speaks on this so frequently, you cannot miss it, about how we should view money, the, the deception of money. But somehow our world has missed it, including many, many churches. And I, I always, I don't joke about it. I find it appalling that our churches now are bringing in you know, all the financial peace universities to tell people how to become more wealthy. How to save up so you can give like no other. You build a pile of treasure, and that's where all the congregation's minds are at, on that pile of treasure. We should do a you know, faith university at our churches. Leave the wealth building to your financial planner. Look at Luke chapter 12 and verse 15. And he said, Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesseth. Christ says, beware of covetousness. That's a warning. Our life doesn't consist of the things that we have or want to have. Look at 16. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. This is what I mean. There's no stopping point for wealth building, is there? You'll never re talk to a rich man. I've, I've made enough. There it is. Stop the pursuit. No, you just build something bigger. Build a bigger business. All right? Yeah, enlarge your bank account. Do something larger, grander, better. This is what this rich man's doing. It consumes his whole life. It is his treasure. It was his days. Look at 19. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. He doesn't realize what shall profit him gain the whole world, yet lose his own soul. He doesn't realize that he can't buy redemption for his own soul, but he's, he's resting in this life on what he's accumulated. He's trusting in what's in his barn. Take thine ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. A false sense of security, isn't it? A false sense of achievement. A bad place to put your trust because, verse 20, but God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. A great fool's errand to collect this wealth, pursue this wealth, and not find Jesus Christ and to serve Jesus Christ, to be rich in the things of God. Um, oh, let's do one more example in Luke 16, and then we'll go to the rich man who actually got saved to show us it is possible. Luke 16, verse 19. You know this. I'll just read a few verses. Luke 16, 19. Well, the last story, Christ called it a parable. This one he does not say it's a parable. It's a real account. And a sad account. Look at Luke 16, 19. There was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. It's a, it's a real story with real details here that would have nothing to do with a parable. But this rich man, right, living well, clothed well, 20, and there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. If anybody walked past these two men, 
They would all say Lazarus has so many needs. This guy is just, he's in dire straits. He's the one that has needs. He's the one that's in trouble. And we'd all look at the rich man and be like, we just tip our cap and say, there's a fine man. There's a man I want to be like. That guy has nothing. He doesn't need anything. He's really quite well off. But watch, 22, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. You know the story. The rich man goes to the place of torments, hell. Lazarus goes to a place of comfort, to very different destinations, to very different lives. What was the difference? I think the poor man, he had more time to find God. I think the poor man didn't trust in something that was uncertain like riches, right? I think the poor man had no sense of achievement in his own glory. He was weak. He looked for the Savior, right? And he found the Savior, the Messiah to come. He believed in the Savior. Meanwhile, the rich man had nothing. He died with much, but he died with nothing he could take with him except for his, his record of sin and his record of having rejected the Savior. That's the sad truth. And this is why in our world today, you look out in our world to reach people. We'll be going on visitation this year and we'll knock on a lot of doors that are folks who aren't well off and they need the gospel, but we'll also knock on doors uh, of wealthy people and they need the gospel. And in fact, the Bible tells us the rich uh, or the poor uses entreaties but the rich answereth roughly. Proverbs tells us that, which means it's hard to reach the rich. They think they know it all. They think they're doing just fine. They don't need what you have in that little book. What do they need that for? They're the success stories. Look at Luke chapter 19. <clears throat> Luke 19. <clears throat> Here is one rich man who got saved. Let's look and see if we can find anything to help us understand how this man came to the Lord. Look at Luke 19 and verse 1. What made the difference for this man? 19.1. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a certain man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. 3. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was of little stature. You know, there's one thing that makes Zacchaeus stand out and that he did have a problem, right? He had this difficulty in his life, in his height. I think it gave him a sense that he didn't have everything figured out. He wasn't on top of the world, right? People didn't esteem him because of his short stature. No matter how wealthy he got, it never fixed that problem. I think he still had emptiness in his life. I don't think the wealth had transpired into total consumption of pride in his life yet because he still felt weak. I think weakness is a key for rich men to come to the Lord. So when rich men, you know, when they face some sort of hard time, health-wise or relationship well, I had a wealthy man call me the other day sounded quite well off but having trouble now with his marriage right so in bank account very wealthy and marriage very poor and it's having him look closer at the Bible again so if something can get through their pride and show them that there's still a man who needs help from above then maybe they can be reached with the gospel here he's looking for Christ and Christ is looking for him. Look at four. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. Zacchaeus was looking for God and he was ready. He was ready to listen to God, right? I think rich men sometimes are so busy and they're like, they make the rules, they're not going to go anywhere, all right, on somebody else's time or somebody else's, they don't have time for anybody else. But Zacchaeus has time to listen to Christ and the truth that he'll share. Six, and he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. Many rich people won't even give Christ the time of day, the conversation. They've got too much business to do. So I think rich people, we hope that they have enough humility to listen and they give enough time to actually listen. To actually stop in a little, a little rinky-dink church and listen to the Bible. Or listen to some you know, little witness in front of them who's, who can't compare to them at all in bank account. But boy, they could tell them about Jesus Christ. They just give the time. Make the time to listen to someone who might be so much 
less than them in the world's eyes, but in God's eyes, they're not. If they got the truth, you need to listen. Seven, when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be a guest with a man that, that is a sinner. The one thing I note here is that Zacchaeus did not have the acceptance of the world, did he? He wasn't one of the good old boys, one of the esteemed. That was to his favor. You know, the wealthy people, they have this peer pressure from other wealthy people to not listen to the Bible. That's their fallback, right? That's their support system that really lets them down. You know, I could, I heard this guy preach a sermon, I could s submit to the truth that it presented, or I could go talk to other rich people and they'll tell me that, uh, we don't listen to that stuff, what are you doing? Zacchaeus didn't have this, he was kind of an outcast, and that was to his favor. Eight, and Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. This is a man who, who is ready to drop that sin of covetousness, right? To the rich young ruler, it was everything. He wouldn't say these lines, the rich young ruler. But to Zacchaeus now, who's found really what's precious, Jesus Christ, his possessions, they're not precious any longer. He says, this is what I'm, I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to live my life. Covetousness is, is, is not going to blind me. Nine, and Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for so as much for so for so much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Zacchaeus wasn't saved by what he says he's going to do, how he's going to live, but what it showed was a complete transformation, a repentance, a change of mind about who he is and who he's going to live for, right? Christ says, That's, this is salvation. He believes in me. He no longer believes in his money. Christ says in verse 10, he's come to seek and to save that which was lost. If we can convince a wealthy person that they are lost, there's a starting point. That that money is not going to, we can, we can be respectful, be kind, but we've got to convince them that that money is not going to buy their way out of the grave. In fact, that money is not going to buy their children's way out of the grave, right? It's a fallacy. You need to know, sir, ma'am, you need to know that Christ is it. He's everything. Money's going to pass away. You can't take it with you. And you've got to teach your kids. You love your kids. We'll give them a sure inheritance, faith in Jesus Christ. We can make the argument. We can make the argument with the wealthy. We absolutely can. But we've got to try to shut down the world's argument that wealth is everything. Wealth is so important. Wealth buys happiness and wealth buys peace. We've got to rebuke that and tell them, no, there's one Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, right? Put your full faith in Him, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank You for the Scriptures, Lord. Help us to not be blinded by covetousness ourselves, Lord. We know as Christians that'll be a sure ticket to waste our lives and pierce ourselves through with many sorrows. And Lord, help us also to take the gospel to the lost, including, Lord, the wealthy but lost. Lord, we know with God all things are possible. We know, Lord, you're not willing that any man should perish. Lord, we know that you wanted that rich man in Luke 16 to be saved just like you wanted Lazarus to be saved, Lord. So help us be diligent servants and come with an answer for every man. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.